film, the third in the series, Witchcraft, A Beginner's Guide, we are going to look at the use of herbs within witchcraft and other pagan traditions. The history of herbs and herbalism is inextricably linked with the history of magic and religion in its many forms. Within all magical and religious traditions, herbs and plants have been used by those who have understood both their magical and medicinal components. Through plants and their vibrational energies, practitioners of the occult in all its forms have connected to the divine and the universe for thousands of years, using plants to raise their own consciousness and magical ability. It is our ancient ancestors that we have to thank for our herb lore today, our hunter-gatherer cousins that discovered what each plant could do and what magic it contained, passing this information down through the ages via the wise men and women of the times that kept the knowledge alive right through to the modern day. Much of modern medicine owes allegiance to the simple plant law of our ancestors, and many scientists believe that there is still much more to learn. It is, however, important to understand that modern medicine still has its part to play, that whilst we may use herbs as a form of preventative medicine and natural remedies may help ease ailments, there is still an important place for modern medicines. Working holistically with both forms, ancient and modern, brings a wholeness to the body and mind when needed. Witches work closely with nature, the land, the changing seasons, the creatures living around us and, of course, the plant life. We understand that mankind is totally dependent on plant life for our very existence. Trees and plants are the lungs of the mother and without them we could not live. The abundant vegetation that grows all around us provides us with the air we breathe, the food we eat, the medicines to help heal and mend the body and mind. Therefore we believe, as do other cultures, that each plant should be honoured and if we need to take from a plant for magical purposes, we ask the plant's permission. If permission is given, then what we pick will come easily and our magical intent will be blessed. If, however, the plant does not relinquish itself easily, we then feel that our request has been denied and we move on to another. So for the witch, a knowledge of working with the plants that grow all around us is part of our tradition and one that many of us are naturally drawn to explore on many levels. As witches, we use herbs within spells, charms, incenses, talismans and much more. We use them for rituals, just like ancient man, to raise our consciousness and awareness to higher levels, enabling us to work our magical rites. Within spell work, we tap into the herb's natural magical ability to produce the desired outcome, or we use them to strengthen the other ingredients of the spell. We use their vibrational energies to bring about change, or to carry our prayers to the universe. Today, as in the past, we know that plants and herbs have a dual purpose, both healing and magical, and that the two properties can be used in conjunction with each other, either separately or together, depending on the requirement. For instance, a herb that can dispel an illness can be used to banish negative energy on a magical basis too. The use of herbs within witchcraft goes hand in hand, and when one is walking a magical path, one cannot help but pick up at least a basic knowledge of this fascinating study. I met up with Jen, permaculture gardener at Tapley Park in North Devon, to chat about the medicinal and magical properties of some of the plants we both use. We're going to be looking at herbs and the use of herbs within witchcraft. Um, any good witch, any halfway decent witch will use herbs both medicinally because they've got lots of healing properties and also on a magical level. Now you know a bit more about the medicinal side of herbs than I do, so if you can talk us through some of the herbs that you've picked for us this morning that would be great Jenny. Sure, well I've got wormwood here, this is Artemisia absinthium, um, it was originally used to make absinthe um, it's a stimulating herb, um, really good appetite mm. stimulant. Um, it's a tonic herb, really good for anyone recovering from illness. Yeah. Um, it's also, um, was originally used as a strewing herb, so it's very good for 
for dispelling fleas and so on and what you can actually so use. So were they, were they just kind of strewn it yeah, across the floor? Yeah, across and, the yeah. floor and what, what I use it for now is dried and chopped around the animal beds, dog yeah. beds, cat beds, so that'll yeah. keep fleas away. Um, it's also really good to grow in the garden to deter black fly and white fly from other plants and also bring beneficial insects mm. to the garden. It's got quite a strong smell to it's it as well. It's got a very strong moment. smell, yeah. It's lovely, it's quite it's a lovely quite. plant. I've got it here, I've got, I've got wormwood dried because we use wormwood, let me just find the dry one, we use wormwood um, within a lot of incenses okay. and it's often, it, it smells much more bitter oh, sure, dried yeah. than it does in the fresh. The other. It actually catches in the back of your throat. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah um, what we what we use wormwood for is in a lot of incenses, okay. and it, it aids um, communication, particularly oh, yeah, if okay. there's um, an argument brewing. It will actually yeah, aid right. clear communication, and it will kind of dampen down tempers. Oh, so it, it will facilitate facilitate a good kind of outcome. Oh, okay. It's also really good for um, if you're working in a magical group. Yeah. Again, if you just throw a handful of the wormwood on a fire, it helps to bond the group or use it in in, in a bonding oh, incense. Yeah. And again, if there's trouble brewing, the best thing to do is kind of throw the wormwood onto the on, fire, onto the fire oh, okay. and then let people speak and facilitate right. and, and, and talk their truth. Oh, so wormwood's a really nice kind of versatile one, but it's much, it, it's very different when it's dried. It's sure. much more bitter. Sure, sure. It is, it is bitter. Yeah. What other ones have you got there? So I've got yarrow here as well. This is yarrow. Um, Yarrow is a really interesting herb actually, it's, it's um, botanical name is um, Achillea and it was um, a herb that the centaur Chiron gave to Achilles oh. to heal the wounds of soldiers mm. at Troy and so what you can use it for, um, a leaf poultice on, put onto a you know, wound that's really slow to heal will actually yeah. speed up that healing process. Um, you can also chew a leaf to relieve toothache. Oh wow! Um, because it's antibacterial yeah. as well. It's also another really good tonic herb. So a tea made from yarrow is a really good spring tonic. Very good for liver function and kidney function. Mm. Um, but it's it's use um, it's used all over the world to stem bleeding. Um, and to just help the healing yeah. of, of, of deep wounds. I've used it in um, um in like a, 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 a boiling it in water and, and using it as a rinse for your hair. Oh, Because right, it's okay. a really nice shine on your hair. Oh, lovely. And in magic, <laughs> yarrow, the only thing I've ever used yarrow for magically is hanging windows for protection. Okay. It's a really nice sure. protective herb. Oh, so that, that's all I really know about yarrow. Okay. What's, what's this one here? Um, this, is, this is lemon verbena. Um, this is um, a very calming. Um, tea that um, you can take as a, as a sleep aid. Mm. Um, it's also got a lovely lemon scent to it. So oh, again, it's really strong. Yeah, that would be a nice incense. I think they could use it for purification. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, um, another strewing herb as well. So that would be a good yeah. purely herb. Or it's a good one for bringing luck. When I use lemon oh, verbena wow. in um, essential oil, yeah. I tend to put it in an oil called Van Van and, and that's to bring really strong luck. So all the lemons, lemon verbena, um, lemon balm, melissa, all that oh, kind of okay. thing really brings up good luck. Oh, right, great. So, and, and that's one of the main herbs for that as well, which is great. And what's what's this purple one? Ah, this That's is really this pretty. Is, yeah, this is a beautiful herb. Actually, this is borage. Um, and um, traditionally, borage flowers were used to bring courage. Um, and that is because they also have a very stimulating effect on the body. Mm -hmm. um, they, a tea made from the flowers and the leaves, will increase um, adrenal function. So, warriors would eat the flowers or tea made from the flowers before going into battle well, to, yeah, yeah. To, 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 to raise the, the, the blood pressure. To and, spur them on. Yeah, yeah. and it's also um, a really good, it's often used um, to disperse melancholy, it's, it's a happy, it's known as the sort of happy herb. So it's like an antidepressant. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's an antidepressant, it's also another good tonic herb, the leaves could be eaten in a salad or made into a tea, they've got a mm. nice cucumber flavour. Um, let me try some. Um, so they're really good added to any kind of 
summer drink. Oh, that's nice. Could, yeah, mm. it's nice. Really, really nice. Don't you put forage in pims, isn't it? You yeah. do. Yeah, mm. you do. You can freeze the flowers in ice cubes, which is a nice way to use them. Um, so I'm guessing if, if, if it's if it's um, a plant that kind of instills some with courage on a magical level, what that could be used for, and I don't know because I've never worked with borage, but on a magical level that could be quite self-empowering, couldn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. So if you, yeah. if you find yourself stuck in a situation that you don't want to be in, sure. then borage would be the plant that you can either, I guess, eat or, or use in a tea or burn yeah, as an incense, incense to kind of bring self-empowerment and courage to move away from a situation. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a real warrior herb, you know, that... It, it it really will give you the yeah. give you the impetus to get on. Yeah. Um that's a lovely plant. It's also very good for bees and butterflies and so it encourages and the wildlife into the garden, yeah, yeah. Definitely. That's a lovely lovely plant. Um what else have we got here? It's interesting. This is meadow sweet. And this is a very, very good natural painkiller. So a tea made from these flowers. Um, it's very relaxing, um, it allayed sleep, um, and it's one of the original ingredients, um, you know, in old, old pain-killing remedies, um, and you could use that yeah. um, at the onset of a cold just to soothe and calm and, and restore um, the body through sleep, um, and it's got a beautiful sweet smell to it hence the name meadow sweet oh that's lovely it's really it, it smells of sunshine it does it's got really yeah sunny, it's a very sun, summery yeah, very summery herb um and you can see that flowering in kind of damp places mm. edge of woodland um by streams we've got lots so of really witches here. cunning men cunning women all, all the people from the you know from 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 way back when would have had quite a vast knowledge of the medicinal healing properties of the plants because that's the only medicines they had. So I guess really on one level, um, modern medicines owe practically everything. Oh, absolutely. To, to, to yeah. the old, the yeah. old kind of wise women and the wise men yeah, from, from days in days past yeah, to actually kind of, you know, find the properties of these plants. Sure. And what I love about the idea of using plants magically as well is usually if a plant can get rid of disease and illness, it'll probably be a very good banishing plant for any kind of Absolutely. negativity so you know what, what what it does on one level it also on, on a mundane level it will also do on a magical level oh, that's right. yeah that's really interesting. And this is another this is a good example actually Th these marigolds yeah um and they're very good for skin problems skin complaints mm. um because you can make an ointment can't and you, you can make that, an yeah. ointment yeah and of course because they've got this beautiful bright yellow color um they're I think used in sun rituals, yeah, um, yeah. summer rituals. So, um, and a component in most skin healing creams and work really, really well. It's good know, for eczema, isn't it? Good, good for, for things eczema. like psoriasis and dry and just you know, kind of dry yeah, skin, yeah. dry itchy skins. Yeah, yeah. sure. So that's a lovely. When gathering or harvesting your herbs, it is important to know what it is you are picking particularly when working with wild plants. If there is any doubt in your mind about what it is you are looking at, then leave it alone. It could be something else entirely. I believe that for this reason it is best and safer to plant and grow your own herbs. This adds to the fun and the all over learning experience of working with plants. Never take all of a plant. It is important to leave most of it behind so that it will continue to grow and supply your needs for the future. Okay, Jen, if I give you those just to move a second, we're going to look at um, some of the dried herbs that I've bought and um, kind of look a bit more deeply into the, the kind of magical side of it, because that's kind of, you know, what, what I know more of. Um, we looked at the um, Artemisia absinthium, which is the... Um, wormwood. Wormwood, thank you. So the other Artemisia is mugwort. Oh, okay. It's a really lovely plant. And dried, it's quite soft. Sure. and fluffy yeah. and this is an excellent herb to use to raise um, psychic awareness oh, okay. so if you're going to work psychically you can make a tea with mugwort oh, okay. and then you can strain it through and you can drink the tea and that kind of brings up your own psychic awareness yeah. the other thing that you can do with mugwort is infuse some of it 
in hot water. If you can pass me the kettle over. Just pour some in. So when you're making your tea and you infuse it, the other thing that you can do with the tea itself is if you leave some, is any scrying equipment, crystals for instance, scrying mirrors, this kind of thing, to empower them and to bring their energy through, you literally just swipe over, wash your scrying equipment with the water. This then empowers it and brings forward its abilities to kind of aid you. The same with crystals, it's a wonderful wash to kind of, if you buy new crystals, um, and you want to get rid of any any kind of energies that may have been on them beforehand because yeah. they do pick up energies even in shops one of the nicest things that you can do is just wash them with the mugwort and I would do this just before I was going to use it for, you know full moons maybe would be a really nice time to do it and obviously you can then drink the tea to kind of aid your own awareness mugwort could be slightly bitter so what I would do is kind of add a little bit of honey to it so just, just to give it that bit of sweetness, sure. to make it a bit more palatable. Mugwort is one that I use a lot. The other one, which is a very interesting herb, is um, vervain. And it has a long history. It's used, or was used, by the Druids. And they would use it to help inspire their poetry, or oh, their really? music, or their oh, storytelling. Exactly. Again, in the tea, it's a very woody herb. Mm -hmm. And they would use it in something called a listral cup. And there were several ingredients in a listral cup, and vervain was the main ingredient. And it would prepare a candidate for initiation, usually first degree initiation, or bardic initiation. And in the Welsh story of Ceridwen, Ceridwen's cauldron, vervain was one of the main ingredients in her cauldron of inspiration. So the Druids will use this in a drink to inspire them, to bring forward their poetry, to, you know, to, to bring forward their... Um, and storytelling or their music oh, and also for first degree initiation it gives a person courage because okay. it's about dying to the old world the mundane world and being reborn again into the magical world okay. so you're walking a path that takes courage and Vervain will actually kind of give you that oh, courage okay. again it's quite a bitter drink um, but if you're using it for initiation it's not supposed to taste nice no it's, sure. it's supposed to make you aware sure and Vervain is very good with that And Damiana, now this is fun. Again, okay. with all these herbs, they don't particularly taste wonderful. Sure. But Damiana is an aphrodisiac. Oh, right, <laughs> it will put the zing back in your love life. <laughs> it's got a very distinctive smell, Damiana. Oh, yes. It's it quite has, strong actually, and quite bitter. Mm. Um, you can drink it in a tea if you're going to perform um, tantric sex or if a couple is going to perform the great rite. It actually enhances that sexual energy. It's not um, a plant of bringing love into your life, okay. but of enhancing a sexual relationship, okay. particularly a, a, a magical sexual relationship. You can also add it to um, strong alcohol, so you can steep it in, in alcohol, okay. and that, that kind of makes um, uh, the brew much more intense. So it's, um, it's, one, it's one to be used with caution, sure. because it's quite a strong it's aphrodisiac. Sure. Yeah, but um, nevertheless, it's it's there if, if a couple wants to use it within their own kind of sexual rites or rituals or within the great rite. As a rule of thumb, the waxing moon is a good time to plant and the full moon is a good time to harvest. As the moon grows in its fullness, so do the herbs and their energies rise. Research has shown that the concentration of healing extracts and herbs is by far greater at the time of the full moon. One of the um, most kind of witchy herbs is um, mandrake. I've got a few pieces of mandrake root here. It's rare that you can find the whole root. It's called mandrake for the obvious reason the root grows in the shape of a man. So you get head, yeah. arms, legs and a penis. <laughs> um, if you can find the roots nowadays, they'll cost you a fortune. So more often than not, you'll get them chopped up like this. Um, mandrake is a poison, so you have to be very careful how you use it. I wouldn't recommend using it in any other way except the ways I'm going to tell you now. It's a wonderful protective root. What you can do, a lot of it, a lot of the time it's quite spherical, the root. You can mm -hmm. slice them off. It's quite woody, so it'll cut quite easily. Mm -hmm. And put a hole through it and wear it around your neck as a, a charm of protection. Mm -hmm. 
Mandrake has very strong protective qualities. Mm -hmm. Um, the other one it's good for is fertility. Oh, right. So if somebody wishes to increase their fertility, having mandrake about their person or under the mattress or hanging above the bed mm -hmm. is said to increase fertility. One of the things that you can make with mandrake is something called moon water. Okay. And moon water is really simple. You take a piece of mandrake, you put it in natural spring water, simple as, and it will absorb the water and you leave it on a windowsill from moon rise to moon set okay. for the whole 28 day moon cycle. Now you can't let the sun touch it so it does mean that you've got to make the effort to get up before sunrise. To really take it off the windowsill. Yeah, you sill, take it off the windowsill. Absolutely. Right. When you've made your moon water decant it into a bottle okay. and cork it, usually a dark glass bottle and what you can use that for then, take, take the mandrake out and dry it because actually you can use this again and again oh, and again right, and it's okay, not cheap mandrake sure, so it's a good sure. way to recycle it. Okay. You can use it to, um, the moon water will protect you, will protect your house, it's good for clearing negative energies. If you pour a little bit into a bowl and use bay in particular because bay is very good for dispelling okay. negative mm -hmm. energy and flick it around the house. If you're feeling quite negative yourself you can literally just a little bit of the water oh, okay. on your head. Sure. If you feel that you want added protection around your home, what I tend to do is literally with my finger, draw pentagrams at windows, doors, mm -hmm. and any, anywhere that any energies can come into the house. And what people tend to forget is pour a little bit down the toilet, yeah. a little bit down your sinks, okay. at the, you know, where, where, the, where the overflows in the sinks, all That's of those right. places where energies can come in, mandrake water will help to literally wash away the negativity. And it's something you can make with one piece of mandrake time and time again. Oh, okay. The energy That's of the actual yeah. root doesn't diminish at all. Right, right. So it's a really it's important, important one. Yeah, yeah. Mandrake has some of the most amazing legends surrounding it. Um, back in the old days, it was said that it would only grow um, at the bottom of gallows, where a murderer had been hung, mm -hmm. and it would grow where his seed, where his seed had fallen. So when you know, allegedly when you hang someone, you know that they spill their seed, and the mandrake would grow will grow from, from, that. from that. The yeah. only way it was said you could pick mandrake was if you used a black dog, tied to a black lead, okay. and the lead tied around the mandrake because it is said if, if a human picks mandrake, it screams so loudly that you will die from its its, its oh. cries. <laughs> so it has a lot of very macabre um, legends around it, yeah. but magically it's a really useful herb. But it is classified as a poison, so you do have to be careful. Certainly not, not drinking it, certainly not ingesting it in any shape, way or form. And with all of these plants, any of the magical herbs, you have to use them with respect. So you have yeah. to respect their um, vitality and their individual plant energy. If you wanted to work with something like mandrake, the way that the old people would have used would have been to ingest a piece of it. But today what we do okay. now is we would hold it in our hands and would meditate with it or okay. journey with it and see what the plant actually has to teach us as individuals okay. by using it in that way. And it could be that you and I could both do a journey with mandrake and we'd both pick up different information. But that would be information that we need to use on our magical journey. Okay. So it's a wonderful mm -hmm. piece and I use mandrake a lot. Hanging it in the house is a good protective. Usually over front doors or back doors is a good protective okay. charm or carrying a piece on you. Beautiful. Really, really like the mandrake. Hard to get hold of though. I know that there's an alternative burdock root. Yes. It's very similar, isn't it? Yep. Which is very common and grows yep. almost yes. everywhere. So this is burdock. This is a good alternative to mandrake because it grows wild mm, yeah. here, um, really easy to collect, um, and traditionally used as ma with mandrake as a protection. Oh, okay, route. yeah. So you could do the same. You could chop it and wear it around your neck, yeah. or hang it above the door. Um, it's also very edible. Um, if you can collect larger roots than this fresh, yeah. Because um, they can, do grow really they big. They do don't grow they? really yeah. big. So if you can if you can find nice big fresh roots, you can lift those in the autumn, 
um, and roast them and they're really similar to um, sweet potato oh wow so that's a really good wild so uh, wild in, ma in many food. ways it's a safer alternative to manjo yeah, yeah because it's it's non-toxic it's non-poisonous yeah. um it's very good for treating skin conditions as well yeah um, so you could make um, a tisane or a, a skin wash with these. Um, and Henry VIII apparently used it to cure his syphilis. So. <laughs> 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 it didn't work then. <laughs> no, obviously not, no. But um, yeah, that's very good for, and also is, it's a very good wash for, for the hair, for people who are losing their hair. That's yeah. a good stimulating. Yeah. I like the idea it, though that, so. that it, it grows quite prolifically. Yeah. Because mandrake in this country now is very you can you can find it, but you, you've got to know what you're looking for. Sure. And um, sure. you know, it's probably it, it's, quite difficult to find. I think it is. Yeah, I think it is. So I, I've never found it wild myself, but hey. Sure. Mm. Okay, and so burdock really is everywhere. You, yeah. You'd have no problem finding this. I mean, it grows in most gardens. It's always a good idea to buy um, books on herbs and wild plants, Absolutely. and you know, her herbal books that talk about the medicinal side of herbs and plants, and also the magical side of it. And there are many good mm. books out there. And if you're using the books when you're collecting and working, you're going to be learning so much more about them. And once you've learnt the basics of them, you then start to find out more and more for yourself as you use them. So you may Absolutely. use herbs slightly different to how I use herbs, but that's the beauty of it, because yeah. you learn as, as you go along. Mm. And it's also good, I think, to reconnect with the way our magical ancestors worked. Um, it, mm. it was good enough for them. Absolutely, and I think yeah. it's certainly good enough for us today. And yeah. it's worth exploring the herbal side of magic and witchcraft. Definitely. There's so many beautiful traditions and folklore surrounding plants yeah. as well. So, you know, they're really interesting to read and often um, the, the traditions around them can also relate to their healing properties. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a fantastic thing to learn. Excellent. There are many good books that will help you get started. And when you have begun to look at herbs within magic and how they aid us in so many different ways, I can guarantee that you will be hooked. I have to say, however, that on a medicinal level, my knowledge of herbs and plants is rudimentary. My basic knowledge is from a magical background only. The beauty of magical herb law is that it is an ancient practice, and one that is proving more popular in modern society, so there is much written about it, and therefore it is reasonably accessible to all. Just remember to follow any warnings about certain herbs, and never ingest any without professional advice. Incense is another way in which we use herbs and plants. Man has unlocked the power of herbs and resins by burning them on hot coals to release the plant's scent and magical energy, allowing the practitioner to walk the realms of the other world or to enter a state of meditation and relaxation, enabling them to work ritually or magically. Incense has been used within many religions both to purify and to sanctify and the very smell of blended herbs and resins burning on hot charcoal can suggest to the mind a sense of ritual and magic. One of the other ways that we can work with um, plants is in making incenses. Incenses are used within witchcraft to um, purify, to raise awareness, to aid magical work um, and to create a ritualistic space and a frame of mind. They go back um, to ancient Egyptian times, so they have a long, long history. The church has used incenses for centuries as well for pretty much the same reasons that we use them today. What we're going to do today is make an elemental incense. I've chosen herbs and resins that vibrate all at an elemental level. It's important to understand that all the elements are involved in growing anything. So when you're growing your herbs and your resins anyway, you're using earth, air, fire and water. But certain plants and resins will vibrate more to the water energy or more to the earth energy or more to the air energy, mm. depending on what plants and resins they are. The idea behind building any incense is you pick your resins and your herbs carefully so they vibrate on the energetical level or for the reason that you're, you're building it. So if you're building a prosperity incense, you will be using plants, herbs, resins that vibrate at a prosperity level. So we're going to be doing a nice um, elemental incense. This helps us engage with the plants themselves. It helps us to learn more about the elements and the, element, the elemental that we're working with in magic. And this is a wonderful all-purpose um, incense 
for, for your rituals, particularly when you're calling in the quarters and working within your circles. It will be a really, really good incense to use for cleansing and consecrating and for blessing because you're using the energies that you've put in and also the energy of each of the plants to represent the elementals. So use a pestle and mortar and I'm going to give the recipe out. The first one that we're going to use is a resin and it's copal. I've already weighed it out. There are six dessert spoons of copal here and copal is of the element of fire. So you need to crush it down as finely as you possibly can. And the other resin that is also associated with fire is frankincense and it's two dessert spoons of frankincense. Frankincense is quite a hard one to actually pound down, so just do the best that you possibly can with it, okay? And when you're working it, think of fire energy, think of sun, think of warmth. Really put your intention into the incense that you're making. Start to feel the energy. Tune into that universal heartbeat. A little bit as we were talking about earlier on. Feel the energy, rock if you want to. You can chant if you want to. Particularly the earth, air, fire, water chant that we learned earlier on. All of this helps you to find the rhythm of it and to actually put the intention into the incense that you're making. When you feel that you've pounded that particular resin enough, I want you to add it to this bowl here. Lovely. The next resin that we're going to use is acacia. This is a nice easy one to pound down and acacia represents in this incense the element of air. Again, while you're working the acacia gum, you're really thinking about the element of air and what it means to you, and you're putting that energy into the resin. And that's now ready to go into the bowl. We've now done the resins, they're a nice fine powder and what we need to add now are the dry leafy ingredients and the seeds, okay? It's important that you get the ratio right. You need far more resins to your herbs and seeds. If you use too many herbs and seeds, you're gonna get the instant smell of the resin which is sweet and then it's gonna end up smelling like a bonfire because you've got too many dried ingredients in there, okay? so. Just a pinch of cardamom, and cardamom represents water. Roughly half a teaspoon of cardamom. This needs pounding. And then hibiscus, and just a pinch of hibiscus. And these should pound up relatively easy. And hibiscus represents water as well. So you're thinking of the water energy. much harder to pan with dried ingredients together, they take a lot more effort. Um, with the cardamom, what you will need to do before you put it into the bowl is take the husks out. If you can buy cardamom without the husks on, it's easier. And then when you're ready, you just need to add the ingredients to the resins. I think that's fine, Zena. Scrape as much as you can and add it to the resin itself. Okay. 
And the last ingredient is caraway. And caraway is air. And that should pound up nice and easily. It's got a really beautiful, pungent smell when you start mm -hmm. to pound it. It's a nice, easy one. That's fine. As easy as that. The last ingredients to go into our incense are essential oils. They also have a really long history going back to ancient Egyptian times. Uh, many ancient cultures believe that the essential oils are the very essence of the plant, the plant's spiritual energy. So we're putting the plant form into the incense in its absolutely concentrated form. The first essential oil we're going to use is patchouli. We're going to have eight drops of patchouli, and patchouli represents the element of earth. And then after patchouli, we're going to have cedarwood, which also represents earth, and we're going to have six drops. And then the last one is lemon, also six drops, and this represents water. And then you simply mix the whole together so that the oils are thoroughly blended with the incense. And you've created an incense from many different parts that is now one energetic substance. Now incense can be burnt straight away, fresh, but I always think it's best kept for at least six weeks in an airtight container in a dark cupboard. It just helps everything to settle in, all the smells, all the energies, the magical vibrations to infuse together even more. But you certainly can burn it fresh. To burn incense like this, you need charcoal, which you light. Here's one that's already lit. And you simply pour it on top and it burns. The very act of burning the incense releases all of the energy that you have put into the work that the plants naturally contain and it releases it in, into the atmosphere, out to the universe and it carries your energy, your desires, your wishes, your prayers with it. And this is why we use incense within ritual and spiritual work. As with all magical work, the plants and resins used in incense are chosen for their magical vibrations and are blended together with intent and purpose to create a blend that will aid in the spiritual and magical work of the practitioner. The more you explore the world of herbs, both magically and medicinally, the more fascinating the subject becomes. You begin to realise that there is a wealth of knowledge out there just waiting to be tapped into. As you gain knowledge about herbs and their uses, so too do you learn about yourself and many other aspects of the craft. To know when to plant and when to harvest with the moon, how to dry your herbs, store them, work with them, all becomes second nature and therefore helps to connect you further with the path you have chosen.